You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. One of the things that has come out of this just ridiculous announcement from Friday has been a, a bit of unity from the gun rights community. And one particular push is to get Bill Blair out of his job. I want to talk about this and some other aspects of this with Rod Giltaka, CEO and Executive Director of the CCFR. Rod, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So let's talk first off about Bill Blair here, because every time Bill Blair has said something about guns as the Liberals have been planning this, it, it's typically been wrong from, you know, talking about the assault rifle issue, talking about how police are apparently pushing for this, even though most of the comments I've seen have been against this type of gun control. Uh, why is Bill Blair, in your view, the problem here? Well, Bill Blair um, has, has conducted them, himself um, He's been very disingenuous. Uh, he's pushed um, just clear. I'm trying to watch my language. He's lied to Canadians time and time again. Forget about watching the language when it comes to Bill Blair. Um, and he's lied to me in person uh, when we had the infamous Bill Blair uh, video. Um, and he's just, yeah, he's just acted in such a way uh, that it's beneath the office of a government minister. And, uh, and Canadians, uh, whether they know it or not, are... Um, they're the victims of it. A point I raised earlier in the show is that the Liberals made a, a big stink back in, I think it was 2014, about how it should be police and not politicians that are making these decisions. And it's interesting that now it, it seems like all politicians should be the ones having the power in their eyes. Well, of course, right? So it's, again, they say one thing and they do another. The duplicity of the, of the Trudeau government is, is actually worse than I've ever seen in, uh, in my life. And I've been around a little while. Um, but again, it's everything's for a political purpose, leveraging Nova Scotia, what happened there. That's not a, that story was not a gun control story, uh, but um, nothing, nothing is, is out of bounds for this government. So let's talk about the response, because I, I've spent a, a bunch of the show already complaining, and I think there's reason to do that and talking about why things are wrong. But I also don't want this to become a, a point of defeat for gun owners in Canada, who, who number in the millions here. And I know that a lot of people have focused on the fact that it was an order in council and not going through parliament. I get concerned with that uh, approach to it, because I know that if they do go through Parliament, they're going to get the votes. It, it's that simple right now. So I, I don't want to make that the the linchpin of this. But but is there a response here that doesn't involve a change of government? Well, they are they're more than and than legally entitled to to file OICs. They can do that. Um, the CCFR spent all weekend um, talking with legal counsel and outside counsel as well to see what can be done. Uh, we're working on that. We should have an answer uh, shortly on whether there's anything, but the government's legally allowed to do that. And when it comes to legislation, they, they have a majority government. The bloc will vote any way that the Liberals ask them to vote if there's something in it for Quebec. They are a, a provincial-centric federal party. So, you know, um, honestly, the only way to, 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 to get our rights back or even just to get these rifles back from this most recent ban is just a, a complete change of government. And not only that, but to hold the government that we elect uh, accountable. For. No, no, no easy answers, Andrew. What do you make of the double standard ingrained in this between Indigenous Canadians and non-Indigenous Canadians? Because this is the point that I feel kind of undercuts what the Liberals are saying, which is that the guns themselves, rather than the owners, are the problem. Well, the duplicity of, of the Trudeau government, right, in action again. But, you know, when it comes to that, a few, I've had a few people ask about that, how I feel about uh, Aboriginals being able to hold on to their guns. I think they're talking specifically about the firearms that were previously non-restricted. They're not talking about ARs. Aboriginals were never allowed to hunt with ARs, regardless as long, you know, as far as I'm aware. Um, and the, you know, we, we sat down uh, to a technical briefing right after this happened with public safety. And basically the situation there is that the Aboriginals who are hunting with any of these guns, let's say it's a stag 10 or something, that can, so they find a suitable replacement. So um, I don't think specifically it's like, okay, all you guys are exempt. It's, I don't think it's really like that. It's not, not that I want to defend them, um, but uh, but I don't think that's the way it was framed. And one of the other reasons why you saw this, and you also saw a two-year amnesty, and was overtly communicated to us during that briefing was, the government has no plan. 
They have no buyback plan. They have no nothing. And they had nothing to offer us. So what they did was, you know, it's funny because I was doing interviews all morning since three in the morning this morning. And, you know, I was asked repeatedly, you know, what do you think of the timing of this? And I said the timing was purely political. The liberals are, are, are leveraging the suffering and the pain of Canadians to limit opposition to something that they shouldn't have done in the first place. And then the, the answer is, well, they, they promised to do this. I'm like, yeah, five years ago they've been promising, but they waited till now. And then you look at the regulation and it's extremely rushed. So, you know, this is this is the state of the liberal government of Canada right now. That's actually a great point you raised about the lack of a plan, because when Justin Trudeau was answering some of the questions or doing his version of that on Friday, uh, one of the things that he had pointed out was that we were going to be doing this anyway, and we were just getting ready to put it out before the pandemic happened. And you're right that if that were true, there would be a comprehensive plan, not just a list of 1,500 uh, guns or you know variants of guns just thrust out the door. So if it were the case, that this was farther along, then why isn't there more to show for it? Yeah, there's nothing to show for it. It's a it's a plan that's cobbled together. Um, people in our community are very detail oriented. I'm sure you're aware of that. So mm -hmm. I've seen posts on Facebook about like, well, what's AR15.com.com? How how is that an, an an AR model of AR? So there's all kinds of mistakes and and there's there's things that are left off the list and it's just yeah. It's it's a mess, uh, very similar to a lot of things that that uh, that this uh, this crew does, um, but I don't know. Uh, again, it's all about politics, and uh, unfortunately, um, gun owners are sitting there. No matter how much they comply, no matter how rules they follow, how many rules they follow, no matter how ridiculous, we're the we're the whipping boy for for liberals in Canada. Unfortunately. We're in a, a time right now of, of unparalleled and unrivaled economic challenge. You've got businesses that are shutting their doors, many of which won't be able to reopen. And gun stores have, by and large, been, I think, deemed non-essential across Canada. You know, when a lot of them reopen, what will the economic impact be? Or will there be an economic impact of, of this ban? I, I don't know how much as a percentage of gun sales AR-15s and Mini-14s are. But but is are you hearing from your members, because I know you've got members who are vendors here, that this this will uh, strain them? Well, anything right now is a strain, like literally anything. Mm -hmm. And these are unprecedented economic times. And I think the worst is yet to come, uh, personally. Um, but I don't know. Uh, you know, things like this, and, and some people called this a knee-jerk reaction. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, this, is, this has been aimed at us for a long time. They just weren't prepared to do it. They saw their opportunity, so they took it. Um, I think anything that affects uh, business volume, anything that affects consumer spending is gonna have a, a terrible effect. Everything's, everything's magnified, everything's compounded because of what's gone on with the COVID-19 crisis. So it's, it's a, it's a lose-lose for everybody. What do you think the biggest thing missing from the discussion is? Because I've tried to explain over the course of different times this has come up, the problem with terms like assault rifle, assault weapon. I know that this uh, last week we've heard military grade more than, than we've heard recently. But what do you think is really missing from this discussion that would help a lot of people that aren't necessarily part of your world and, and to a lesser extent my world would help them understand what's at stake here? So that's an excellent question. And it's, an, it's a critically important question to answer. So there's some, in our community, there's some very hard questions to answer. And what I find is after the, you know, the few questions are asked and satisfactory responses are given, it always ends up right down at the big question. Why do you need an AR-15? It's the hardest question to answer. I've been trying to explain to audiences and just recently the CBC 12 interviews in a row is that um, what people, not what non-gun owners have to understand is that the people that own guns and specifically expensive, um, very specialized niche firearms like an AR-15 or some of the other guns on the banned list, people that own those are very detail-oriented, law-abiding, careful, vetted individuals. So the people that own those guns, their lives, th these firearms are centric in their lives, they're central in, in who they are. So the people that they associate with, their social connections are all gun people. Um, they volunteer at their own expense, built 2000 clubs across the country. They volunteer, they hold charity events there, they hold social events, they do sports, they create new sports. Everything that they do in their lives have to do with their pursuit, whether it's 
you're into show dogs or you're into something else or, you know, skydiving or whatever it is, it's central to who these people are. So when you're when Trudeau says something like there's no place in Canada for guns like this, what we hear is there's no place in Canada for people. That's what people have to understand. City because they don't have a they don't have a factual basis to attack us because it's licensed gun owners do not represent a disproportionate risk to public safety. That's proven. In fact, I don't know if you ever saw that conversation I had with Bill Blair. I got him to admit that. So anyway, that's really important. It's not it's not just a hobby. Go find a new hobby. Go find a new toy. It's not like that. And dismissing gun owners, millions of them, by the way, dismissing them like that is it's just not good behavior, whether it's about guns or anything else. Yeah, you know, what the Liberals have tried to do here is draw a line in the sand and say that, you know, Grandpa's lever action is not in the same class as your Mini-14 or your AR-15. And uh, sure, the guns are different, as many guns and variations are different. But the line that I found the most egregious is that these serve one purpose alone and one purpose alone only, and that's killing people. And to me, as someone who owns one of those guns, I'm like, wait, that like, what what is being said about gun owners here when the liberals say that the only purpose for these guns is killing people? No, that, I mean, that, that's just not true. But you're right. There is something egregiously offensive in that. Well, there is. So the 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 full line is their their firearms designs. These are gu guns designed to kill the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time. Yeah. And like. 90% of what the Trudeau government says, people like Justin Trudeau and Bill Blair, it's an out and out lie. And that's a real problem. That's a problem for so many other reasons that we can get into later or some other time, right? But it's a lie. The AR-15, and I was actually wrong about this myself, was actually designed as a sporting or a hunting rifle first, and then it was adopted in the late 50s as a military rifle for the US military, because what manufacturer doesn't want to sell their, their product to the military, right? It's big dollars. So and but at the same time, I want to be fair to both sides of this argument. It doesn't matter what the origin of the firearm is. You know, the Remington 700 is a military sniper rifle, but it's the most bolt action rifle and hunting in, in the world. So that's that's beside the point. Now, if the only use for this gun was to kill as many people as fast as, as possible, then why is it being issued to the RCMP? Is that their mandate? If you want to look for guns that are designed for that purpose, you'll look at light machine guns, heavy machine guns mortars, and what I've been telling people <laughs> that, that I've been interviewing with time and time again, this is not, an AR-15 is not a military grade assault rifle. No. Those have been banned since 1977. This is a semi-automatic rifle only that was certified by the RCMP for safe use in Canada. Yeah, I think that's a hugely important point, and it, it I think it's really necessary to get through the whole "why do you need it" problem. And and I mean, I've sometimes gone the philosophical route on that, which is that we aren't a needs-based society. But you're right. I mean, a lot of the lines that have been drawn here are, are very arbitrary, very disingenuous. The one thing I would ask you in closing here, Rod, have you found? Because I know you've got a lobbyist who is a, a fantastic advocate, Tracy Wilson. Have you found there is any willingness from anyone in the Liberals to hear you out, to sit down? and take your meeting in a way that suggests they are open-minded. So I, I don't include that video you did with Bill Blair here because that was more him selling rather than him buying. But have you found anyone that you would say was approaching this in earnest that potentially could be an advocate within the caucus? So I'm going to say no. Um, the Liberals are um, in line because the, I think the Liberals, uh, uh, the, the Liberal whip, does a good job in keeping everybody in line. Even even back in the C-71 days, T.J. Harvey uh, from Eastern Canada was whipped into voting for Bill C-71, and, and I know that he opposed it personally. I, I'm not making broad assumptions, but he did meet with us, and he knew that this was a political solution. Again, I'm not speaking directly for him. I want to be careful about that. Um, and then he chose not election, so maybe that says something. Um, this is entirely ideological, and... You know, I don't want to put too fine of a point on it, but doing things the way that the liberals are doing is incredibly divisive. It is incredibly corrosive to national unity. There was a, around 200,000 people affected by this ban, and this is not it. This is only the beginning. Yes. There will be no firearms by the time that they're, they're done if they got another majority government, I assure you. And um, yeah, I don't think there's uh, there's we just have they have to be thrown from government and a replacement put in that's going to just be fair to Canadians, not specifically just to gun owners.
Rod Giltaka, CEO and Executive Director of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Thanks for your work and uh, thanks for coming on today, Rod. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.